it's a massive pleasure for Solutions House to host brilliant women mastermind, catalyzing the brilliance of BIPOC women with Shirley McAlpine, Radhika Fox, Anita Otrubu, Julia Collins, and Lisa Flavia Garcia. And I think we're ready. Should we give them a big welcome? Woo! Woo, woo, woo! Woo, woo, woo! Woo, woo, woo! Shirley, Shirley, Shirley! Take a seat. Shirley, I will hand over to you. Thank, Thank you. you so much for bringing this panel to Solutions House. Um, it's so wonderful to see everyone this morning. Um, so we are waiting on one more person who isn't stuck in the climate week traffic. And if you know, yes. You know, if you're coming from Midtown, you might as well walk, right? So, if you come so, from Brooklyn, you might as well if walk. If you come from Brooklyn, you might as well. So, um, so she will join us um, when she arrives. So just to say that. So, my name's Shirley McAlpine, and um, I am a climate activist by via being a coach and a leadership facilitator. Um, and I run my organisation, Shirley McAlpine and Associates, and I work with climate. Um, clients who are solving for the most pressing issues of our time. And we bring together problem solvers for that end. So that's who I am. And oh yeah, hold on, I forgot, I forgot. Are we, are we? Can we do the slides? I'm pressing. Kim, is there someone I need to point it to? Okay, all right. Oh, here we go. All right, so um, let's do this. All right. So one of the things that we do, so we wanted to say why we call it Brilliant Women, and there's a QR code, you know what to do, right? So why we call it Brilliant Women, <laughs> we don't need to tell you that, you know, since COVID. Okay, good. Um, one of the things that we created was that we wanted to create a unique spaces, transformational spaces where women can come together and have really authentic conversations about their experiences in life, their experiences personally and professionally, and have safe spaces to confront the challenges that we are facing. I think one of the things that we need to pay attention to, there is not enough conversation about what it's like to be a BIPOC woman leader in any space, and specifically, given this is climate week, in the climate, energy, and the water sector. So hence why I needed, and I think my first climate week was last year, and I could see that it, this was missing. So I really want to thank Solutions House for partnering with me and allowing me to bring this to the Solutions House, right? So we're going to have really authentic, straight conversations um, this morning. And, um, and I really want to acknowledge and appreciate the panel. And let me introduce who they are. Because I've asked them to be real, authentic, and share personal stories. And, um, and so I really appreciate you for say, saying yes to that. So let, me, so let me share with you our panel, right? The first we have Radhika Fox. Radhika has over 25 years experience in executive management policy and sustainability. She recently served as the assistant administrator for the EPA's Office of Water, overseeing a 4.8 billion, I didn't say million, <laughs> billion dollar budget and nearly 2,000 staff. Previously, she was the CEO of the US Water Alliance. Thank you, Radhika. And then next we have Julia Collins. Julia Collins is founder and CEO of Planet Forward, a decarbonization platform for the consumer industry that helps create sustainable products. She previously co-founded Zoom, becoming the first black woman to create a billion dollar valued tech company and has also founded Moonshot, a climate friendly snack brand. She serves on several boards and invests in female and BIPOC entrepreneurs. Thank you. Lisa, we didn't come to play. I just want to say that <laughs> with the panel. Okay. 
Lisa, Lisa Garcia is the Regional Administrator for EPA's Region 2, overseeing environmental efforts in New Jersey, New York, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands, and eight federally recognized Indian nations. She's an environmental lawyer with extensive experience in environmental and climate justice. Yeah. Lisa. And the person who's stuck in traffic, Anita Tubu, <laughs> who's going to be here. Anita Tubu is Senior Director of Sustainable Energy for All, leading the Universal Energy Facility to develop renewable energy pro projects in Sub-Saharan Africa. Her extensive experience includes heading the Nigeria Electrification Project, which achieved over one million connections, impacting five million residents. We, we can give a round of applause to Anita in this we can go here. Okay, so, let me take a seat <coughs> here. I want us to imagine like we're around, the, you know when women sit around a kitchen table and we're having a chat? Okay, we're having a chat, people. <laughs> and if you're not a woman, thank you for being here as an ally. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, because we need allies. All right. So, I want us to start by painting a shared picture of where we are um, in terms of BIPOC women leaders, but I also want to begin with celebrating us. So, my first question is, um, if you were to give BIPOC women leaders their flowers, okay, for their work in the sector, in the sectors, the climate, energy, and the water sector, if you were going to give this the flowers, what will you give it for and why is their leadership so important? So who wants to take that? Hmm. I, what I observe and feel and sense and know is that BIPOC women leaders within our space are creating some of the most collaborative solutions. As we're building organizations, as we're building policy, as we're supporting the largest infrastructural projects and becoming part of the green energy solution, we're doing so in a way that is reaching across aisles, that is including indigenous communities, that is working together. And so I'd really give us our flowers around the incredible collaboration mm -hmm. that really is, I think, the, the core of the way that we work in this space. And I, I, first of all, I love that you started the conversation with giving ourselves flowers because we don't do that nearly enough. And I had, if I'd thought about it, it brought you a bouquet, actually, uh, <laughs> uh, to give you flowers for holding space for these kinds of conversations in a week that is very much about substantive issues and policy ideas and program ideas. So thank you for holding space for uh, this inner piece of it as well. Um, but building on what you said, I think, um, you know, I think women in general, have the ability to see and think intersectionally. And if you think about the climate crisis mm -hmm. and many of the environmental challenges that we face, we need intersectional solutions. Um, and I think the um, courageousness of BIPOC women of color to bring that kind of intersectional solutions to a space that, you know, we are in the crisis that we are in with our climate because of uh, a patriarchal, extractive way of um, being in relationship to each other, to our economy, mm -hmm. to our planet. And so to have the courage to bring intersectionality uh, in the face of that, I think I give you all flowers. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. How about you, Lisa? Um, yeah, so all of that. And um, I would say also the resilience, right? We just, in this space as women, as women of color, we, um, we are leaders in so many spaces, at home, with family, and then in these spaces um, of leading the movement, the resiliency. So just making sure that we are connected, that we stay true to our values and still kind of march forward. And so, you know, I would just say throughout <coughs> this wonderful career, um, even coming back to some of the environmental justice leaders, they have been in this fight for 40 years holding down yes. truth and power and still in it. And so I would say thank you so much for the resilience and never giving up. And then the one thing that, and we may talk about it a little bit later, also some of the, the younger uh, women 
in this space are also adding this self-care component, taking care mm -hmm. of self, taking a moment. Like we had a few <coughs> sessions where people started with, women started with breathing and yoga. And so it's just, it's just wonderful to see that also, that this added piece of, and oh, we need to take care of ourselves also. Yeah. And I love that. So flowers to everyone just continuing to create a, a great movement of women of color in this space. Great. Uh, we will come back to self-care, and we're <laughs> yeah. going to go dive a bit deeper on that. Now, we're going to cover a number of things, and, and then I'm going to move stuff on. So if it feels like I'm moving stuff on, <coughs> it's because I actually am, because we want to like make sure you know, we, could, uh, we could do a whole day, week retreat on this. But um, I want us to also name, I know this is Solutions House, but I want us to name what are some of you think, some of the key challenges that, that women of color are facing in the sectors that you're working in and, and see if you can share that and put some personal experiences as well so we can like uplift some of the things that are actually happening um, to women leaders. Yeah, I, I can kick us off just because um, I just had breakfast with a woman who's leading um, a whole environmental state commission and uh, so I asked her some of the questions too. One of the things that I've find is really challenging is, and for me, being a lawyer in a very male-oriented space still, and then um, in the environmental space, um, this issue of uh, someone says diversity or people of color and they look at you. <laughs> like, oh, Lisa must have the answer, right? Because, <laughs> and so that to me has always been so challenging that my work is an environmental lawyer and no one else is tasked with this job of also figuring out the diversity, equity, inclusion uh, piece to the work or leading uh, you know, women of color. On the other hand, also feeling that sense of responsibility for the, uh, you know, the younger generation or people who aren't in leadership. So making sure that we do bring people up in this space and that balance was always, uh, has always been a challenge for me. Um, Anyway, that's what I would say. The wonderful opportunities, but also realizing, um, <laughs> hello. Uh, <laughs> so sorry, everyone. <laughs> it's crazy. You made it. Yeah. Just settle in. We're, we're good. We're good. No judgment in this room. No judgment in this room. We're good. Um, so, what we, so let's pick it up. Someone else. Um, key challenges. What do you think the key challenges that you've experienced? Oh gosh, so many, but. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, in the, so I just uh, recently, uh, as you mentioned, left the EPA where I was the first woman of color in the 50 years of the Environmental Protection Agency, I was the first woman of color to lead the Office of Water. Um, and if you look at the water sector, uh, folks, uh, it is still, especially in leadership positions, dominated by white men. Um, and um, yet, if you think about every community is impacted. So I think, you know, the, I feel like one of the challenges is when you're often the one woman at the table, the one person of color at the table, the expectation mm -hmm. to hold all of this wisdom that yeah, Lisa just talked right. about for whole communities, right? Yeah. But also, um, the frame is set. And, and so you have to show up in the context of the frame that has been set, right? right? Uh, and you have to frankly show up better, smarter, more prepared, oh. because what you say, uh, what you propose, especially if it is something that's new and not the way things have been always been done, you get challenged much more yeah. easily. Mm -hmm. And so the ch that, I think, of you just have to show up better um, yeah. Yeah. than they do. Always, yeah, that challenge of being the one, you know, I'm a venture-backed tech founder, so, my challenge is being in the 0 0.02, you know, percent, yeah. less than 0 0.02, not 0 0.2, 0 0.02 Zero percent two. of venture dollars go to black woman founders, you know, and and I, I, but I'm good, you know, I'm I'm the first black woman to found a unicorn tech company. I've raised hundreds of millions of dollars in my career. My rounds are going to get done. But when I'm going into pitch, I'm not just pitching for myself, I'm pitching for the next black woman who's coming in to pitch, and the one after her, and the one after her. 
And so there is this challenge of always getting it so right. Yes. And wanting to make sure that with every word, every interaction, every pitch, that I am speaking with such brilliance that it is undeniable to support me and to support other women like me. And, and that is, you know, that's the mantle. I don't wear that like a cross to bear. It is mm. the work, but it, but it does come with strain and it does come with heaviness sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Anita, you've just arrived. We want to welcome you. Uh, yes, and I know that you've been running around. Is there something you want to add here, or do you want to, shall we move on to the next, and then you, what do you want to do? We're on the topic of challenges, right? Yeah. Um, I guess for me, I work in, so first of all, I'm Anita Tubu. Um, I'm a senior director for the Universal NG Facility at Sustainable NG for All. Um, essentially, we provide grant subsidies to private sector companies who are in the business of developing mini grids or deploying standalone solutions for productive use in African countries. Understanding that most of these uh, projects aren't the most viable and uh, oftentimes find it very difficult to attract finance, my role is to sort of bridge that viability gap and also make to make the access to um, electricity affordable for the end users. Now working in this sector, working in the energy space, you can imagine that it's, it is a predominantly uh, male dominated sector. And typically, when you think of engineering roles, they are typically occupied by men. And so being a leader in this space, um, in, in engineering or in energy, in energy project, um, you have that, I guess, preconceived uh, notion or conception that women don't necessarily belong in leadership roles in energy sector related uh, projects. Um, however, getting the opportunity to work in this space, you find that, first of all, women can actually take on engineering roles. They can climb ladders and mount PV panels on top of um, households and so on. Um, but there are also other roles beyond engineering roles in the energy space. You could be a project manager. You could be uh, you know, an accountant responsible for the finances of the project. You can be into monitoring and evaluation, HR, so many different roles to, pl to play. Um, and I just find that when women are in um, these key positions of leadership, um, they have so much more to, to give. Um, and I think because they're put under this pressure uh, to perform, they outperform, right? Because yeah. they, they want to be able to justify themselves being there. Um, so yeah, that's really the, ch the challenge for me, but I, I believe I've been able to overcome it. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's move on to then, given the, one of the things in terms of the work that I've, been, I've done over the years I'm a, as a consultant and working with and, and coaching women leaders and coaching women of color leaders, the work is that transforming cultures is like turning a tankard, right? So that's, that's we're, we're all still waiting, you know, <laughs> for that to happen. So the work becomes, what's the work that you can do to deal with the environments in which you're working in to succeed? So I want us to talk about the inner work. I want us to talk about what work that you do on the inside to support yourself with dealing with the outside. And, um, and so a definition for inner work is developing our emotional intelligence and cultivating excellence in our relationship to our thoughts, our feelings, our beliefs and actions for the purpose of gaining a life of satisfaction and joy. Imagine that at work, right? Satisfaction and joy. Inner work is about changing ourselves and not focusing on always trying to change our external circumstances, but our relationship to our circumstances. So given that, what is the inner work that you are doing to create the success that you've had? And um, as a BIPOC woman leader in the sector, uh, or what did you think, the, or, or and what is the inner work that you think women, BIPOC women, women of color need to do in order to be in the sector. Who'd like to take that? I don't mind going. Um, I'm fortunate <coughs> enough to have um, had Shirley as uh, an executive coach. Mm -hmm. um, I think women, whether black, white, whatever, um, in leadership positions need the opportunity to um, be able to vent, to speak out. I suffer from oversharing. Sometimes I'm a bit <laughs> too transparent. And sometimes people weaponize that against you. 
you know, and before you know it, you have you have issues in the workplace. So. Um, identifying that person, whether it's an executive coach, whether it's a family member, a friend, or somebody in a similar position to yourself who you can trust, who you can speak to, who can give you the needed sort of advice and support that you need to sort of yeah, address the challenges that you face on a daily basis um, at work is, is so necessary. It works immensely for me, because I think I probably would have been in a lot more trouble <laughs> <laughs> if I didn't have uh, those sessions uh, with Shirley. Thank I you for saying that. That wasn't a plan, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll take it. I'll take the advantage of it. Thank you. I have to say, I really appreciate this question. And, and we've ta ta just talked about this yesterday, Shirley, is I I'm very much early in this journey of understanding um, that we have to do the inner work in order to do the the work that we're doing on behalf of people on the planet and that um, unless we hatch a better you, you can't hatch a better world, right? Mm -hmm. That there and and this is I am very new on this journey. I was telling Shirley this story yesterday. So I left the Biden administration about six months ago. I was appointed um, by the president on day one of his administration just a few hours after he was sworn in. And I worked every single day, um, as Lisa knows, every single day uh, without stop for about three years. And I was pretty broken, if I'm honest. I was, my well was so dry, to use a water metaphor, um, when I left. And, um, and I just was chewed up, you know? And I did that to myself. I didn't need to work that way. I did that to myself. And so, I think part of doing the inner work is actually acknowledging and holding the belief that unless we do our inner work, we cannot be our best self in the, yeah. in the external work. So like that, I'm, I am trying to deeply ingrain that as a core belief, mm -hmm. um, you know, as I'm moving into the next chapters of life. Yeah. Radhika, I feel that so much. I have had those years where you work until you see your bones and your skin, you just, literally work yourself to the bone. And, and maybe we don't have to, but I think sometimes we're working from, or I've been working from a belief that unless I do, that I won't be able to be successful. And so yeah. for me, a lot of this inner work is realizing that power really begins with connection. Influence begins with connection. The ability to do great work in the world always begins with connection. And it's really hard to connect with someone else if you're not connected within yourself. Um, when I kind of began my inner work journey, I did what I always do, which is to find a coach. Mm -hmm. You know, when I took up weightlifting, I found a coach. When I took up running, I found a coach. When I took up my inner work, I really found a coach and a teacher, and I've been working with them for years. And one of the things I do every day is a spire check-in. S-P-I-R-E, and I just do a scan of myself. How am I doing spiritually? How am I doing physically? How am I doing intellectually? How am I doing relationally? And how am I doing emotionally? And really like scanning my body and scanning my energy center across those five areas every day has been a really great way for me to have a, 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 an inner work practice right. that is normal and that is daily and, and really something that's ingrained in my life. So it's the range of finding something that works for you, but the, I, when women that I met over the many years don't spend time to invest that in themselves, they end up in, we're gonna talk about self-care in a minute, but you know, the cost, I think the, the cost that women pay is too high sometimes yeah. and we have to pause like collectively the cost but also the individual cost yeah, yeah. I think yeah so I'll add that <clears throat> I I came to understand it the same way um, because of realizing that I was taking on too much burden and suffering so um, I became vice president of litigation at this large environmental group and you know, being the first lawyer in my family, the first graduate school, uh, there was a piece of me that felt like this is success. And so when you show up in this leadership role and you're the first person of color 
in this leadership role, and the room is all white, mainly male, that, that responsibility comes on, and you think you're carrying the weight of your family, of your, you know, my Puerto Rican heritage. Um, so, you, so I did go into that work, work, work mode, and then supervising, uh, managing attorneys that were only white, just always coming home and dealing with it in myself and not realizing that. I was internalizing so much of this weight um, and then taking on these challenges. And I think um, I got to a point where it was clear I had to leave, um, even though there were great changes made. Um, and then the next job, realizing that, and I just, like I said, someone just said this, it phrased it really well, the kitchen cabinet. Like, who do you depend on? Who do you go to? Who do you rely on? And so now in this position that I have, um, I have a great person that I always go to, and you know, we shut the door and we, it's like we create our own little kitchen yeah. talk. Um, and it's really important to have those relationships. And maybe it's a coach or a friend or someone else in your, in your sphere of this movement. Um, but understanding that you're not alone. And it's so important for you to take that time. And I came to learn that. And I'm thankful that I did. But I wish I was in the audience you know, 10 years ago hearing it before I went down the wrong track. And now I'm on a much better path. So, yeah. And I love that spire. I never heard that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really important that we take care of ourselves and do that inner work. Yeah. I think there's also an importance of having really explicit conversations about it because I think one of the things is you've got, you know, when you're thinking about people who are coming up behind you, they're looking at you and they're thinking, I don't want to, uh, I, that, I'm not, no, <laughs> that's for someone else. And so we're going to struggle to find people to step into the leadership roles if how they're seeing the cost. Yeah. to you right. it's yeah. like why would I like why would I do that like really yeah. um, okay so then it leads us to talk about um, self care without sacrifice now I don't want it to be doom and gloom but I just want to start with stating some of the facts around women's health and just a little bit of the facts around women's health to contextualize this conversation because I really feel so passionate about the urgency of us taking care of ourselves. And one in five women are dying from heart disease. Mm. Maternal mortality rates are higher amongst BIPOC women and in some states they're like three, four, five, six, seven, eight times higher. Women make up eight, and it's getting worse given the issues around our reproductive health right now and rights. Women make up 80% of all autoimmune diseases. We know that autoimmune diseases are when the body starts to attack itself. Women of color are also more statistically more likely to develop autoimmune diseases than white women. African-American women are three times more likely to develop lupus with more severe symptoms and complications. Hispanic and Asian women are more likely to develop than white men to develop lupus. And um, I like to get, we talk about data and big data. Like we are, there are certain health issues that, and there are many more health disparities um, that we could name. So I want us to talk about, spend some time talking about that. Can you share a time when you felt that you were sacrificing too much of yourself? Is there anything else you started to talk about that? Or, or what's the hardest lesson that you have learned about your self-care? And what did you do about it? Like, how did you turn it around? I'm going to do part one, part two on this question. Anyone wanted to go first? Um, I, I think one example. Oh, no, please go. <coughs> um, one example that I was thinking of is um, a couple of years ago, folks may remember the Jackson water crisis where uh, the entire city um, of Jackson, Mississippi uh, was without water for days and days. And, um, you know, I went down to Jackson many times um, as we were trying to address that crisis. And, you know, you, you met with um, mothers who you know, were going to just Herculean efforts to be able to make dinner and give their kids a bath because they did not have water in their homes. Or I, I remember going to visit with students at, at Jackson State University. The, the um, water crisis happened right when the school year was beginning. So they were starting their school year having to go to porta potties um, to go to the bathroom before going to class. And so, you know, there was a f huge federal disaster declaration, emergency response from many, many agencies. And um, 
And I just worked myself sick um, because of that crisis. And, um, and honestly, I, I didn't have, I, I'll, I'll, be, I'll say I failed on the self-care terribly. Like, I got sick. I got really, really sick where I just actually had to stop and rest and figure out how not to do that again because that didn't serve um, the EPA. It didn't serve the people of Jackson mm -hmm. to, to, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so, as I said earlier, so I'm now on this journey of figuring it out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so it's okay, it's okay to... Well, to acknowledge, like... Well, and I thought I was on the right side of it, right? Because like, you were doing course. good work. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah. you have to help all of these people who are suffering right now. Like, that is more important. You can take care of yourself later. later. Yeah. Right? That's a later thing. And yeah. so I think learning that, that has not how we can show up in the work. None of us can. Yeah. yeah. I think, yeah, I'll just pick up on that. Um, I think it's that that desire to... to to do well and to make sure that you're successful, um, and then understanding this leadership role. Um, so I also ended up um, in, in a different role, but realizing that I had been gaining weight, um, I was crying a lot more, but thinking that it was because all the problems in the world, and not realizing that it was really emotional and that I'm not taking care of myself. Um, and so um, my asthma became worse. Anyway, you could ju it just plays out in so many different ways. And if you, if you look at it in silos, I have asthma, so my asthma is worse. So that's a health issue. Um, you know, we're trying so hard in this justice movement, and so I'm crying. Of course, look at the world. And then, um, you know, you're working hard because there's so much work to do. And you don't put it together that it's all coming down on you. Um, and so I think now, fast forward, um, just coming to that point of like what, asking myself what makes me happy, like being with family, for me, exercising, biking, um, eating healthier, but you know, just recognizing that, um, yeah, you're not, it, you can't say, okay, I'll take care of myself later. Because unfortunately, some women do that, and later doesn't Doesn't come. arrive, right. And you, and you <coughs> see that, so, um, yeah. So we definitely have to incorporate that self-care. Before we go into, we're gonna, just wanna add another thing before we, to continue this conversation, because some of the themes are coming up in what you're sharing, is that um, Dr. Gobo Mate talks about the four characteristic character traits that contribute to the onset of illness. And when I came across this, I was like, these are the themes that come up in conversations that I have with women of color leaders or women all the time. And I wanted to name them because it's fear is feeding into some of the things that we're sharing about. And one of the things he talks about is the emotional concern for the needs of others, mm -hmm. the suppression of healthy anger. We've got a lot to be angry about, really. The identification of duty, role, and responsibility and the belief that you are responsible for other people, emotions or yeah. needs, or, and then the belief that you, are, you must not disappoint anybody. And we have been, you know, if we think about like the messaging that we're taught as we're growing up as well about the responsibility, um, but the, there's a cost to that. So first I want to get your reaction to that, like whether that feels familiar. Um, but he's um, thought saying that those are the things that contribute to the onset of illness, those things that contribute to certainly the growth of autoimmune disease that's happening. Does that, your reaction I've to your response? I've never seen these before and I'm absolutely blown away. I think you'd be hard pressed to find mm -hmm. a person, particularly a woman, who doesn't feel that they <coughs> are carrying all of these. Caring for the concerns of others, suppressing your anger, that, that sacred rage that is so important to be able to let I go love of. that sacred rage. Holding that inside, you know, believing that you've got to save everyone and that in doing so you should never disappoint anyone. I, I, I didn't realize that this framework exists, but if I'm really honest, all four of these mm. are things that I feel in myself and that I see in my family and my friends. Yeah. yeah. I think the question is, what do we do, what do we with do this information? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So and let me tell you something, I've been working on number two. Big time. I have been mm. working on yeah. finding the right outlets for sacred rage. 
whether it's dancing <laughs> or writing or sometimes just screaming into the void at the beach. Mm -hmm. nice. I feel like number two is so important because yeah. we are literally trying to change how everything in the world works right now. And nobody's gonna let that happen easily. Right. Power's never given, it's always yeah. taken. And there are times when you come out of a meeting, I don't know if you've had this experience, and you're like, what, what? just a <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, but in the past, I would just kind of tidy myself up, you know, yes. line my pearls back up, put it back together. Yeah. Don't and now, anything. like, I take a beat and I go somewhere and just release that anger, and I think that's so important. And sometimes when you've talked about people that are poor, <laughs> is actually having someone you call and you say, you, I'm sorry, <laughs> what? Like to, yeah, to be able to say that and to, or, or sometimes it's just to, like to be frank, to cry. Yeah. yeah. You know, and yeah. because crying is okay, crying is like, it's okay to not be okay and to acknowledge that you're not okay, which is also part of the healing of getting to be okay, yeah. right, yeah. rather than, um, what else? Well, what, how do you how do you deal with it? How do you get yourself back? How do you? So just going back to the self care issue, I've been terrible uh, with that. And just speaking from a women perspective, um, a woman's perspective, uh, I used to head the Nigeria Electrification Project, which is a 550 million dollar World Bank and African Development Bank program, uh, and I was based in Nigeria, and it got so bad in terms of wanting to overperform because women, like I'd said, still in Africa, unfortunately, they're considered to play the role of a, you know, a housewife and to look after the children and so on. So I wanted to show them that I could do this, this and you know, produce great results. But it got so bad that I fell ill. Like you, I have asthma as well. And even when I was in the hospital, I had my team members in the hospital with me with their laptops, and I'm still like, have you sent that email? <laughs> and I'm literally super ill, I can barely even move. Mm -hmm. um, but that pressure was so, it was there, right? And even being in that situation, I, I still didn't learn from it, you know? I was still trying to um, overperform. I was so bad that I guess I also, in a bit to do well, I also, in, made my team members um, overwork, sadly, uh, to the point where I would rent out hotels, um, have them sleep in the hotels, work 1 a.m. in the morning in the conference rooms to evaluate proposals. It was that bad. And I think what helped me was moving uh, to the States when I got this new job. And by the way, when I got this job two years ago, um, and they told me I had to move to the States, I was like, why do I need to move to the States for? He said, oh, you know, you need international best practice. You know, you've been in Nigeria for some time. I'm like, what do you mean? I am international. Can't you hear my accent? <laughs> you know, what do you mean by that? But moving here and um, the fact that they, you know, they, they value, uh, I believe, value mental health, personal space, work-life balance, uh, that helped. Um, it forced me to take into consideration the mental health of my team members and their well-being, and in turn, that meant that I started thinking about myself mm -hmm. as well, and I started taking time off. Um, so I think I'm just grateful for even being in, you know, this environment that forced me um, to, to, yeah, to get the balance, take care of myself and get that balance right. Yeah. And, and the impact that it has on your team, the impact on yeah, others. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So um, let's take a moment to come out, come to the audience and see if there's a, do you have any questions for, oh, listen, there's just like, <coughs> it's me. <laughs> <laughs> do not even finish the sentence because I have a question. Hi there, right. good afternoon everyone. My name is Kim Steele, I'm a filmmaker, and my question is about if you have any tips for developing courage or cultivating courage, when you know we're all trying to do really hard things, trying to get in leadership positions, and we have all these forces like very aggressively telling us, no, you're wrong, or that's a bad idea, it's not gonna work, and then we start to second guess ourselves. So any tips or any times where you've had to, um, had to get something done, not had the courage, and had to find it? Mm. Mm. Yeah. Good question. This is such a good question. Yes. Yeah. It's something that I'm working on, actually also with my little boys. I have a six-year-old and a two-year-old, and one of the sayings in our family is, do it scared. Like, learn to do it scared. But I love that you talked about the word courage because at the heart of courage is the word heart. And I think the ability to do things even when you're scared 
really does begin with being whole in your heart, you know, and taking a heart-centered approach to every project, every interaction, every pitch, and doing the work to make sure that you're whole in your heart, you know, and that might mean self-care, that might mean spiritual practice, it might mean physical practice, it might mean the way that you think about eating and bringing things into your body, but like really making sure that you're feeling whole in your heart, I think is the best way to get into that practice of just doing it scared. I never wait until I'm not scared to do something. Almost everything I've ever done, I've been terrified to do. But I've just done it so many times that it feels normal to me to push through the fear and to have that courage. So one thing I'm working on actively right now is assuming my success and um, assuming it's going to go my way. And and this really came to me that you know when I left the EPA, I had a I went on a, a, a retreat. It was very much reflecting on the, those the last three years, etc. And there there was this sort of this, it was called inner intimacy a workshop, which sounded a little cheesy, but I went anyway. I like and, um, and and one of the, the prompts that the coach had used was, you know, to like sort of reflect back on your mental model as you, you've done big things in your life. And I realized I was the first woman of color who ran the office of water, and I did it scared. The whole, like I had such a fear of failure, even though I was very successful. It was the same thing with the organization that I had launched before that. I did that for five years, always worrying about my failure. And so the feeling tone, like, right, when you go through life with the, I'm gonna fail, and so I'm gonna work really hard to not fail, the feeling tone of all of it is not um, nourishing. Right. And so I was like, you know, this next chapter, I'm just gonna assume my success. Yes. yes. I'm just gonna assume it. And if I don't, we'll figure it out because that is such a more luscious, uh, enlivening way to approach um, whatever it is that we're doing. So you assume your success, because I'm assuming your success. <laughs> I love that. Probably to yeah. add Let's take there. another question. Yes. Um, how do you face the... Uh, There's a mic coming to you. Okay. Um, how to face the uh, imposter sy syndrome, yeah. if you have come across it? Yeah, funny enough, I was literally just about to say that occasionally I do have, um, well, many times I have imposter syndrome, particularly when I walk into spaces and I don't see people that look like myself, or if I feel as though everyone here has been to Ivy League schools, private schools, and I don't have that background, what exactly am I going to talk to them about? How am I going to connect with them? And how I address that imposter syndrome is by reflecting on my past successes. Mm. You have to remind yourself, Anita, you electrified, you brought electricity to over a million people in Africa. You know, Anita, you did this, you did that, you led a team of 60 male engineers, you know, with no engineering experience. Um, when you remind yourself of, you know, the fact that you've been able to overcome challenges in the past, then you feel justified in being there, you know, and, and I guess that imposter syndrome naturally sometimes wears off. Yeah. yeah. I think for me, oh. <laughs> I was gonna say, sometimes, um, yeah, sometimes for me, it's the, um, well, I grew up in Venezuela, so there's also a language piece. Like, I didn't go to Harvard, and sometimes words don't come to me that easily in English. Um, and so, uh, yeah, just reminding myself, one is the worst thing they can say is no, and so that just means you were back where you were a minute ago, but if they say yes, or if they listen to you in however fifth grade English I say it or something. Um, and, and just um, being okay with the butterflies or that nervousness, like just it's gonna be okay, it's gonna be okay. Or maybe I had two hours of sleep because I was so nervous the whole night before. Um, but just constantly reminding myself to just be okay with that nervousness, be okay with that fear because there's only one way to move forward or to get to the next place. And the, yeah, it's funny when you walk into those spaces, you know, sometimes like the White House or a courtroom, and I'm like, why am I here? <laughs> and that's like, like why no, are no, they no. there? Yeah, I should be there. there. <laughs> why should be there? Right. Yeah. <laughs> I think one of the things about the imposter syndrome is to recognize that it comes inside of the conversation that we have been socializing about us not having us place. 
Mm. And so you have to claim your place where you are. And you have absolutely every right to be there. You don't have to go to an Ivy League school to bring value. That's, a, that's, a, that's like messaging that's been told. It doesn't diminish people who've been to an Ivy League school, but it doesn't diminish those who went to a state school either yeah. and state <laughs> colleges. We, there's, you have value to bring. So what's the value that you have to bring? Who are you? What's your purpose? What you're fulfilling on versus like having the measures of others which says that you're less than. And I think we have to start to really break that, break the stranglehold that it has on women of color, has communities of color, and the continuous like socialization. We have to, there's so much unlearning to do. Mm -hmm. um, in the quick round, one minute of, a like, couple of minutes left, like what's one thing that you would advise um, a BIPOC woman leader to do, or BIPOC women to do to get into the sector? One thing, what would you say? I would say identify um, inspirational leaders who look like you. Um, also identify mentors as well, uh, who can sort of guide you through the process. Um, and um, yeah, I guess um, speak to the fears that you have and direct you in the, you know, in the right path. That helps me a lot, just being able to identify those people who are doing well, um, right. asking them how they got there, you know, how they address their challenges, and um, understanding that it's possible for you to get there. Thank you. Any, any yeah, there? I, I would say um, if you're thinking it, there may be someone else in the room thinking it. Yeah. So, so open your mouth and just to have that courage, I guess, to say it because then other people may be thinking it and they're like, thank, thank you for saying that or thank you for thinking that. And so definitely find your, uh, your partners in crime or champions that are with you um, because it really helps you realize you're not alone in this uh, and then it gives you that energy to move forward. Right, thank you. Yeah. What about you, Julia? I think that's right. I think like once you find your thing, mm -hmm. never stop talking about it, but also make sure that you're listening to what other people's things yeah, yeah. and that you can re-pitch and be <laughs> a huge soapbox and an amplifier for not just what you're doing, but for what your, your community and other people are doing as well. Yeah. Great, thank you. Radhika. Assume your success. Just assume <laughs> your success and build the team and the community around you to get there. Yeah. I'm sorry, could I add another one? You need to be passionate about what you're doing. You know, you can't just expect to be successful, to be happy with what you're doing if you're not passionate about what you're doing. So, um, yeah, for me, knowing that I'm impacting lives through rural electrification, um, no matter, you know, the challenges that I face, I'm always, it's easier for me to wake up and continue doing the work because I love it. So just identifying that area of work that means something to you, that makes you happy. Great. So thank you so much to our amazing <laughs> So great, some powerful insights. Thank you for sharing your story. And um, I know there are so many sessions that you can be at in Climate Week. There's so many competing places you can be. So I really appreciate you all for spending time here. If you are an ally, I hope you've got some things that you can take away as well in terms of action. If you're a, a, a woman of color, you know, stay connected as well. Um, if you're an organization who's committed, stay connected. This is the beginning of something for us in terms of bringing this conversation to climate that's deeply missing and that us having much more explicit conversations about what BIPOC women leaders need to survive in the sector, not just survive, actually, backtrack, backtrack, thrive. So um, love to stay connected with you. Here's a QR code, and, and, then, and then we'll be in contact with you. And thank you, Solutions House, for being willing to host this um, com important conversation with us. All right, thank you.